about Mike Parker, he is a big builder, of course, for handlebars, um, making uh, quality, affordable um, bucktails, but they're also creative. They're always looking for the next thing, the next element. They had their eggheads, I think, two years ago, and uh, the name is escaping me right this second of uh, their new spinner bait style with a body bait behind it. Um, uh, apparently there's a long list of fish already caught on them and uh, really cool of him to uh, choose us to be the um, launch point for them uh, to showcase his new bait. So we're grateful for that. And uh, Mike is also a guide, uh, handlebars musties. Uh, if you're going to St. Clair and uh, you need some information, he'll get you set up. He'll teach you the ways and then you'll know forever at that point. And uh, he does know some tricks. You can talk to guys like uh, Frank Thurston and then they'll tell you. Uh, he's, uh, he's he's the real deal when it comes to being a musky guide. Um, and he also cares more than probably anybody about fishermen, fishing, and the fishery. And donates a lot of his time and uh, his, his baits as well to increasing resources uh, and, and getting resources. And he worked hand in hand with Dr. Merkovitz um, from uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources, who's an, also a researcher. And uh, they did the St. Clair telemetry project, which wrapped up at the end of last year and has just recently been written up. Mike's actually in possession of the um, of the paper. I don't even know if it's been released yet, um, but he's very intimate because he helped them. He was there for the catching um, and tagging process. And uh, he's going to tell us a little bit about what we learned from it. And it's a great example how when you get to the end of the research, what it is we can take and how it is we can catch more fish with it. Um, it kind of brings a full circle to why we do the research, why we invest ourselves, and then what we get. Because it's great to protect the fishery, it's great to be supportive, but it's nice to get something in return too. You know, I'm sure the whole world's not altruistic. And uh, Mike Parker will hopefully show us uh, how he as a guide was able to benefit from the information that was learned. Without uh, taking up any more time, uh, Mike, welcome to uh, the 2021 Symposium. Thank you so, so much. Hey, Danny. Uh, thanks a lot, man, for having me. And, uh... Yeah, thanks for the uh, kind words and that. And uh, yeah, for the eggheads you were talking about, um, we actually, I started those in 2006. And then in about 2008, I kind of shelved them because I couldn't get them exactly where I wanted. Then all of a sudden, uh, spring of 2010, I was like, light went off. I'm like, I know what I need to do. And so they were actually born uh, for spring for opener for June opener uh, 2010. So they've been around for 11 years now. Um, well, I guess Danny's gone. I thought he was, I thought we were talking for a second. I guess I'm talking to myself, which is, Hey, this is just a normal day. Then if I'm talking to myself, uh, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Mike Parker from, uh, handlebars, musky lures and fishing. Uh, what's that? Oh yes. The, uh, Lisa, if you could put the, uh, that that's the one. Thanks to Dana for reminding me that that's not on the screen because I don't have a clue what I'm doing. That's why I got takes two tech advisors to get me just to go up there. So uh, I'm here uh, to help you uh, help talk about the Lake St. Clair acoustic telemetry study. If you want to hit the next slide. I know this is what you were expecting today. <laughs> you were definitely expecting to get an Albert Einstein of uh, fishing uh, seminars and or fishing uh, studies and uh, from Stephen uh, Marklevitz but hey you got me this is this is what you're getting just a passionate musky nut uh, I just want to continue to learn more about um, our fish and their movements and that and I want to share um, share that knowledge also what I can share like uh, from what I know but like everything, you have to have a disclaimer, especially when I'm around, there has to be a disclaimer. So yeah, this is my disclaimer. I'm not a scientist. I'm definitely, definitely, definitely not a biologist. I'm just gonna share my personal knowledge of uh, this study and hopefully it will uh, shed a little bit of light on, on it from a musky fisherman side of it. Um, I know uh, Steven's done other uh, talks on it. So you're getting an actual fisherman's side of this not the total study part uh which uh, we'll go into in a second here and how could you not start off something without musky porn you got to like that that's just a big beautiful musky that we caught last fall on lake st Clair. where did she come from 
We don't know. With that fish there, we don't know. She was a beautiful, fat, fat, 54-inch, beautiful, slimy girl. And she went away nice and strong. She come and visit us for a bit. How many other people have caught her? Where was she born? Where has she been for the last 25 years? Who knows? That's why the telemetry study is uh, so important. So we can see how did this girl move out throughout her life? Where has she spawned? Where has she been? Where has she eat? Where has she go in the summertime? Where has she go in the fall? Where has she go in the winter? That's basically what this study, study is about to help find out how do these muskie get to be so big and beautiful like she is. Um, this picture here, uh, if you know, uh, if you know who he is, you're, you're lucky. That's uh, Jim Herod. Jimmy has uh, a lot of his older friends known by uh, James as his really old friends know him. I've always known him as Jim Herod. Um, Jim's been such a instrumental uh, person in getting this study into Ontario and bringing it to Bruce Bauer and the Bell River chapter of Muskies Canada. He, like uh, Jim, he was the, uh, on FMZ boards, he sat on those. Uh, he's done different uh, director positions on Muskies Canada, and he was very, very, very instrumental in getting this uh, study to come to the Canadian side and to find the volunteers, to find the people to uh, raise money, like to contact myself and, uh, you know, find people that can help out and who are passionate about it and who really, truly do care and just want to give back, just the same as Jim has. Unfortunately, last year, uh, Jim passed away. He passed away uh, February, I believe it's 21st last year. And uh, you know what? He's going to be greatly missed. And the musky community has lost a freaking awesome dude. Like, he's he's one that we can't replace. Like, uh, if you know Jim, that's that's him. Like, that's, that's his excitement. I, I, I love – I had to include that picture. I, I had a couple pictures from that day, but uh, – I had to include that picture. Unfortunately, his legs were really bad then, and he had to sit down, and he couldn't even come out fishing with us on the boat. So, but just seeing that picture there, it's just uh, that's Jimmy. Yep, that, that's so awesome to see. So, th thanks to Jim for doing that uh, and getting me involved, and getting Bruce Bauer and the Bell River Chapter of Muskies Canada involved in this study and bringing it here to Ontario. And he's without him, I don't think they would have had near the success that it has had. Um, the project duration, uh, this is, this, all this information is coming from the GLaDOS website. And uh, it's uh, started in May of 2016, and it runs through May of 2024. I believe they have the end date because that's what the lifespan was supposed to be of the tags, the, the uh, acoustic tags that are inside the fish. But some of the tags will run on longer, and then hopefully those musky, like to get a 12-year tag, like the battery life last. Hopefully it stays that long and uh, they can continue to get the data for those years. So uh, if you if you want to go and see uh, what Stephen and them, they've just posted up on there, the newest study they have, you can go to the GLaDOS website that's up on the screen now and uh, take a look at the studies. And there's actually one on a drop down screen. You can pick what species of fish uh, you want to check about. And uh, it's, it's got a lot of really great information. Go there and uh, that's where I get a lot of my information other than firsthand actually going out to help out. So uh, that's a great website to check out. And then I also have uh, some documents that have been shared to me from uh, Stephen Markovitz um, from the Ministry of Natural Resources. Um, he's a local guy from down, the, down our way here by Lake St. Clair. And he's the one who they were hoping that he could have, but he wasn't able to make it. But if you go uh, check out the Musky Canada Odyssey videos, um, I think you should be able to find them right through the Musky Factory. And, and thank you to Lisa and uh, and John Anderson um, for running that. If you go to the Musky Factory page you can, on YouTube, you can find the Musky Canada videos. I do believe are still up there, or it might just be on the Muskies Canada um, official uh, Facebook page. But they are online and. Uh, I'm sure somebody will tag where it's at. So uh, there, yeah, there you go. You got it up there on the screen. Thank you, Lisa. A huge shout out to uh, Muskies Canada. You know what? Um, the Jim Herod, like I said, with Jimmy, without Jimmy, uh, uh, 
spearheading this and then talking of you see in the picture here uh bruce bauer he was the chairman uh in the bell river chapter and he was uh the main guy and then he turned in after he stepped down from chairman he stayed on as uh the main guy in bell river for working hand in hand with jim and with steven to do the uh the study bruce is a wealth of knowledge on this uh tagging study he will definitely know a lot more of the technical side than i do i uh i just enjoy helping uh he he can tell you the different terms and all that fancy stuff i'm not that fancy but you know without uh, groups like muskies canada and the volunteers um you know at the core like uh like john anderson was saying before you know like at the core values of what these clubs are made of they're able to put that work or that money in that that's raised and the people that help out to projects like this which in turn give us the information to help us uh learn more about these fish that we all love we're all so passionate about muskie and sometimes their passion gets in the way and you know what it's studies like this here that actually make it amazing to watch when you got everybody coming together for uh one main thing um here you also had uh, uh muskies inc and the michigan muskie alliance uh they helped out uh, also they had club members that come over here to help fish but they are very instrumental in helping out on the uh, michigan side of the border for uh doing the work over there i don't know everything they've done but i do know they've helped out a lot and uh, i know uh with steven and others they've given them props so i definitely had to uh, give all them props because uh, without these clubs uh, a lot of these projects won't get done uh so how many muskies are are uh, in, tagged and in the system uh, there's 143 muskies that have been tagged so far uh they assume 104 are still alive uh, and 14 are unknown uh that could be fish that like the other ones that are missing out of that could just be fish that haven't gone past recorders they're like sneaking by and they're or they're traveling in different areas of lakes because lake st Clair, there's not a lot of recorders in the lake it's uh actually not many at all like compared to the size of it so some of these muskie could just be traveling around in areas that they don't have a recorder so they don't know um, where they're at it takes about two years for the data to show a pattern of a single muskie it doesn't mean they don't they don't get data back every year but they need to see after the first year what that muskie did and then the second year what does it do then does it is it going back to the same spawning areas in, in the summertime is it going to the same areas areas chasing food in the fall is it doing the same thing like where are these things traveling during the different times of the year and it's really neat to be able to look at a map like this here uh, with all the yellow dots. And this gets me excited because every one of these yellow dots is part of the GLaDOS um, project. And every one of these is a recorder that's either in Lake St. Clair, Lake Huron, the St. Clair River, Detroit River, Lake Erie, and all throughout the Great Lakes. It's It's amazing how many of these recorders are out there. They are not part of the actual uh, Lake St. Clair Muskie telemetry study, but with the tags, that, the acoustic tags that are in these muskies, if they pass by any of these recorders, they'll get picked up and then they'll, they'll uh, be able to get that information back to the study, which is why it's so important to uh, get these fish tagged and out there. And I have, I'll go over some other information from these yellow dots on some other fish here in a bit. Now, John Anderson already uh, talked about the one there, and we'll touch on that. We'll get one again, but uh, that's what all these yellow dots are. It's recorders, and you can see how many uh, how many fish or how many recorders there are, like at the mouth of the Detroit River, and then right through Lake Erie and that. But if you get over to the uh, east side of Lake Erie or Lake Saint Clair, and that's all the cluster of dots in the middle of the screen. There's almost nothing like there's not that many extra uh, dots over there. And now you can see all and go if you go down to that yellow one in the middle. Yeah. So that's just over here. So all that there, there, like there's hardly anything there for the GLaDOS system. But in another slide, I'll show you the, what the cool thing of this uh, telemetry study has been doing. 
Um, there's uh, actually three different types of tags. Uh, two of them are work together. So the acoustic tags work together. The one is the transmitter, which is inserted into the stomach of a fish. And it sends out a ping signal as it swims around. And every time it passes in a, a receiver that's down on the bottom of the lake or river, then the, rec the uh, receiver records that data and they know when that fish went past there. So that's, that's so critical that these acoustic tags keep working and keep reporting to give the MNR and the DNR the information for where these fish are going to. The second or the uh, third uh, tag that's on them is uh, up on the pectoral fin and it's the ones we've been using are orange and they have uh, a number on them. Uh, many people have seen them. You'll see them in another slide, um, the orange tags. If you happen to catch a fish, and it doesn't matter what kind of fish it is, if you catch any fish with a tag on it, record that number. Try to take a picture of it if you can, record that number down. If you can, try to get a length of the fish. Uh, girth would be great. Take some nice pictures of it. If there's any like scars, like say lamprey marks, anything weird, like if they have uh, growths, um, there's a muskie that you'll see, he's got a growth on his jaw. If there's anything weird like that, please just take pictures of that if you can. Don't keep the fish out of the water for 10 minutes taking pictures. Just snap some quick pics if there's anything different. Get that quick uh, data and then that way there, send it off. Even if you don't know if it goes to the MNR, send it off to the MNR or send it over to uh, Bruce Bauer from the Bell River Chapter of Muskies Canada. And they will know how to get it into the right hands of the people that can uh, get that information. So, And that goes for any fish you catch, but especially for the muskies. Ha -ha. Uh, so the next few slides here, um, Stephen sent them over to me. And these ones here are really special to myself and to my family. And uh, extremely uh, special um, to the uh, Cox family. Um, so these next slides are of a fish that I caught um, November 1st, uh, 2017. Uh, this fish here was the first fish caught of the day. We had, uh, I, I didn't go there to purposely fish. I just went to uh, go and help the guys uh, with the tagging, whether it's running fish, whatever they needed. So we got the everything set up and we're ready for fish to come in. We're just waiting for all the charter boats. Like there was, uh, I forget what there was, a dozen boats or whatever out on the lake fishing. And we're waiting for them to come back with fish. But I brought two rods. I brought two rods. I brought like a chewy acid crackle chewy because why not because that just pounds fish everywhere i bought a couple of thirsties and i think i only brought like three or four baits and i said i'm going to go off the the dock there or the rocks and cast for musky so i brought my gear uh asked the guys if they wanted to fish and none of them wanted to fish and like seven to ten cast in bang i hit a fish right from shore steve can't steve can't believe it and uh jimmy there uh jim Herod, he was just laugh, laughing his arse off there he couldn't he couldn't believe that we got one so fast. And uh, so that fish there, um, they tagged it and uh, they tagged it in the memory of Michael Cox. Uh, he had passed away November 18th, 2016, out in front of Bell River. Um, uh, from talking with his, his mother, Kathy, um, she told me like his heart just exploded when he was out there fishing and he was passed away right then. Like there was nothing they could do, but uh, Local musky anglers were also right there. His uh, wife was screaming for help. People were on the boat helping him right away. And, uh, you know, this young guy, he he passed. So this fish here is uh, tagged in his memory. And there's also a receiver that is tagged in his memory. So if you see on this next slide, um, right where Bell River is, there's a red dot. Well, all these red pins on here are the receivers that have been bought through the Lake St. Clair telemetry study. So these ones here were all paid for by whether it's the MNR, funds through Muskies Canada. I don't know if American funds have come over to pay for them, but these were bought through the study. And I'm so super proud because the one in front of Bell River was paid for through a fundraiser that we did to raise money uh, for this. And we did a memorial tournament in Mike's name um, for the top 50 pike tournament to raise money for this. And, uh, we raised almost enough money to buy a tag, 
for a fish and a receiver, which wasn't cheap. And uh, we chipped in the rest to get the receiver. And uh, luckily, Stephen was able to get the uh, receiver put in Mike's name as well as this fish here. So external tag fish uh, 10262 is actually Mike Cox's fish. And you can see it was caught in Bell River on November 1st. And if you look at the arrow that goes off to the right, the same day, it traveled over towards Deerbrook. So it went probably about seven miles or, or, or a couple miles, a couple miles, about three miles down the lake. And then you see from November 5th to the 8th, it went all the way back down to uh, like Pike Creek area and Pew's Pike Creek area. And then it did the same thing from the 12th to the 17th. And then it come back again to, from the 17th to the 25th. So in that month's time, that, that fish did a lot of miles of travel. And like, like you can see, like in three days' time, it went like a good distance. And it was kind of weird if you want to go to the next screen there. So on this screen here, you'll see there's only three dots. And this kind of got uh, the MNR worried. And Stephen thought that this fish might have died because you see the three dots that are in Lake St. Clair. Those are the only three recorders that it passed, like Bell River, Puce, and then uh, Deerbrook. So it, it only passed those, and then they had no more information at all on this fish. That was it. And so they thought the fish actually died, which is why we need this study, so they can know whether these fish are surviving, where they're going, and uh, how long they live. Well, last week, Stephen just sent me this next slide. And this makes me so happy because Mike's fish did not pass away. It's still out there and you can see it has been traveling all the way from St. Luke's Bay on, uh, on the east side of Lake St. Clair, all the way up to Anchor Bay up on the top left side of the lake. So it's like, it's gone like from one side of the lake to the other, that's over 20 miles and it, it's done some traveling. So it's awesome to see and like where they thought this fish had gone, and died it didn't it, it was uh swimming around somewhere else so it's awesome to see that uh this fish is still going and uh there's more recorders out in the lake now for the uh telemetry study but the uh, glados um the glados recorders on the left side of the uh screen are the ones that were really um really good for uh recording uh, where this fish has gone. So without those, we wouldn't have known that this fish was still alive and going. So that's awesome to see that uh, the acoustic tags are working. So exactly what John Anderson was talking about. And uh, you know what? Um, John's a machine for what he does up his up in Ottawa. I wish I had an eighth of his knowledge. I'm just a musky nut with a passion. He... He's a sponge. He just soaks it all in. He knows what he's doing, and he can explain it detailed, like as good as the MNR biologist. And when he was talking about um, 007, well, this fish here, it was named 007 just because the last three numbers on its tag was 007. It was caught on uh, May 23rd in 2016 in Belle Isle, Michigan. Um, does he have other double agents with him? I think he does. I think he travels around with other muskie, but we wouldn't know that without this study. So uh, crazy thing with this fish, I'll give you the cliff notes on it because I know Stephen has done a full presentation on this fish. This fish has gone, and you got to go to the Muskies Canada Odyssey thing again, and you'll see his presentation. It's got like, it's, it's animated. It's amazing. This fish has gone from Lake St. Clair down towards Toledo, hang around the western basin of Lake Erie, all the way down to Buffalo Harbor. Uh, yeah, down, yep, Fort Erie, Buffalo. Yeah, way down there. The exact opposite end of the lake. And he came back. So that was from 2016 to the spring of 2017. Spring of 2017, he actually showed right back up to the same area and he pinged off the same or recorders that he was caught at. Cool thing is this fish in 2017 hung around only in Lake St. Clair. He hung around in Lake St. Clair. He did not take off, go down to Erie and do that big run again. So they just thought that was an anomaly. And this is where they talk about it takes at least two years of data to be able to pattern fish. 
Well, in 2018, that fish basically did the same long distance run all the way back down to Buffalo Harbor and back again. And that was just insane. Like they were saying that at that time, that fish probably did over a thousand miles of swimming. Like that's crazy, especially for any of us musky guys who don't think musky travel much. 007 has uh, different things for you to believe. Like it's, they do travel. Since talking to Steven, uh, he was letting me know, and he's, I know he's talked about it at the Odyssey. There have been two other fish that have made similar trips as what 007 did. They were tagged down in the same areas, and they've ended up down towards Buffalo Harbor or definitely down to the east end of Lake Erie and then up to the north shore of Lake Erie on the, on the far end. So it's pretty darn cool to see that there's not only one, but there's three musky that have made similar trips all the way down to the other end of Lake Erie. So for people who don't think these musky travel, they are traveling a lot. I know uh, from talking with Stephen, he was saying a lot of the musky, uh, like they're tagged to go to the Thames River area, kind of stay in that area. They do, some do travel around, but majority of them stay on that kind of that end of the lake. And ones that are tagged down Bell River Way or Detroit, Detroit River on the American side, they seem to be ones that drop down into the western basin of Lake Erie. So with seeing some of these, the thing that I'm thinking of, and I can't wait to see down the road, I'm wondering if a lot of these fish head south. Like, they, it just seems like they go south, like after they're, after they're uh, done spawning in the spring, because you get so many that come out of St. Clair that have gone down south. So I'm wondering if, say, some of our fish that we get here on St. Clair during the summer, I wonder if they've come out of Lake Huron or if they've come out of, what's that? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, if they uh, come out of Lake St. Clair or, or uh, out of Lake Huron, down the St. Clair River into um, Lake St. Clair, which I'm hoping that we can uh, find out through this study, which is why it's so important to be a part of studies like this. Um, I got to give a huge thank you to like all the local anglers. I know I've already touched on like the Bell River guys, uh, but you know what, without the local anglers that have come out, because there are a lot of just regular, regular Joes and regular Joannes, no Karens, that have come out to help out with this study by, you know what, they, they have to have a uh, live relief tank on their boat, so a revival tank to be, able to part, be a part of the study. And they put in their time. So you got some regular locals that have come out. You got lots of charter captains, uh, especially a bunch of them come out of the States. Like I know I'm not going to start naming because I know once I do, I'm going to forget guys, but I know there's a bunch of the guys that all the big boats were over here fishing and helping this out. So they're donating their gas money and their time to come and help out with this study. So huge thank you to everybody who uh, is a part of it. Um, the Bell River uh, Marina. Like the Lake Shore uh, Township for letting the m &R set up right there. Um, area you can see in this picture here where you got the gas docks. So the big boats, they can come in. This is one of the fish, I believe, that was caught from shore. And it was just being taken from the one holding tank right there, about 8 feet, 10 feet over to the uh, electroshocking tank. So huge shout out to Bell River Marina and the Lake Shore Township for letting us or letting them be a part of uh, their or use their facilities to uh, do this study. Uh, this this fish here, like I was just saying, was just coming from uh, right behind where uh, Mike was. There's a tank where the fish go into when they're first brought in and they kind of sit there and relax until they get to go be electroshocked. So if we go to the next slide, here's the tank. Uh, the fish on the right, the little itty bitty tiny thing is the one I caught that day. And uh, that one beside it, I believe, was 47 inches. And uh, so Stephen, he had told me uh, he did, he couldn't believe that I caught a fish so fast. And then he couldn't believe it that, like, four minutes after I caught my fish, there's another guy yelling that he has a fish on. So one of the other uh, m &R guys, he went running over and got that fish. And that's the one that you see Mike running back with. So they, they got both of those fish to uh, be in that tank. Oh, can you go back to that other slide for one second? Um, so, it, <laughs> so if you can see on the uh, ends of this tank, 
um, there's the electroshocking plates. So you do not want to uh, put your hands in the water when they shock because uh, you'll you'll probably die. They had a defibrillator and everything there. So it's, it is a very uh, – it's, it's very serious stuff what they're doing. So every time these guys shock a fish and ladies shock a fish, uh, they are risking themselves too. So they got to be very protective of what they're doing. But uh, that's I just wanted to touch on what that tank there was. That was the actual electroshocking tank. So this fish here, you can see, this is the one I was talking about that had a growth on its jaw. So if you catch a muskie and it's got something like that, if you can take a picture of that and uh, get your other quick measurements and that, that stuff like that would – go a long way to help out the MNR. Uh, this is a fish that was just, just set up on the, uh, the table and getting ready to be uh, go through surgery. Uh, here they're just doing a fin clip and you can see they're putting the uh, clipping from the fin in the, uh, oh, in the little envelope there. But uh, that's just another picture of part of the process. So they take a little fin clip and I guess they get the DNA and that out of the fin. Uh, like Sean Landsman, which Sean's Project Noble Beast, I was lucky to see one of his first times he presented it in the Corth Lakes years ago. And I tell you, the fish nets that he uses for his project, no other, no others compare. Anybody that was there for that seminar knows what I'm talking about. He he knows what he's using out there. But I liked what he was talking about this morning. And it was pretty cool that I actually, being a dumb fishing guy, have a similar slide to what he has. So. I am absolutely nowhere as close to Sean, but I got the same picture, buddy. I got the same mindset. It's the uh, water going through the gills, and that's he, he already talked about it this morning, but this tube going in the mouth, it just keeps the oxygen going through their gills. And here we're lucky enough that we're right at the Bell River Marina. It was in November, so the water's cold enough. We just pumped fresh water right out of the, right out of the lake, right into the mouth. So this fish here, like they went back and they survived right away. What happens to the muskie after? they go and they go to school you know what there's three fish right there these these three fish they come off of one boat uh that boat was out there like not long after we got our fish these three fish come in off of theirs and you can see on the tails of each one of these they have an orange uh tag on them and those orange tags uh that's the uh that's the one the numbers that you can record yourself and send back into the ministry of natural resources but they put them in these tanks. I forget the time lengths, but this is just a recovery tank. They just had operation. I think they're probably like the crazy people out in uh, Area 51. They're like, hey, what just happened, man? Like, we just got implanted. They're embedding chips in us. What's going on here? And they're probably just having their first meeting like the Area 51 people. Uh, these two fish here, those are the uh, first two that you've seen in the tank. Uh, the one I caught uh, is a little itty bitty one there, then the, the nice 47. They were released right back into uh, the marina because they were caught like 50 feet from this spot. So they just let them go right back to uh, where they were caught. And a uh, cool thing was the big fish, it took off right away. Uh, they have a uh, remote tracker. We put it in the water and you can hear the pings. And my little guy there, it stayed in the marina for quite a while. It stayed in there for hours and then it did finally leave the marina also. Um, so that was all Bell River. Um, Bell, in Bell River, um, they had to rely on the public. They had to rely on help from the public to uh, come in and uh, angle the fish, put them in their live wells and bring them in. And uh, kudos to everybody that's helped out with that. Tagging in the Thames was a little bit different. They uh, were using the electro boat. Uh, here's a good selfie with myself. And then on the right is uh, Stephen and Mike. He's right behind me, uh, both from the MNR, Steve on the... Steve on the right there, he's uh, the lead guy and the head guy and the guy that knows it all from the Ministry of Natural Resources. He's, go, like I say, go watch his seminar and you'll be blown away. But uh, the boat right behind is their electro boat. So they got the wires off the front of the boat, which threw, put the uh, signals out and it ex zaps the fish. And it's pretty crazy to see, like they actually are driving the boat around and it zaps and then a muskie floats up to the surface. They net it and they're actually able to um, set the frequencies to target musky and not get other fish. So it's even nuts that they can know how to set it for different size of fish. Um, that day there, it was kind of cool because uh, I had my clients uh, out there, the two guys that are in the front of the pitchers. Um, we just got back in from fish in the lake and that, and then uh, 
Stephen sent me uh, a message saying, hey, um, we're tagging here in the Thames, just seen you. Um, you, you and your uh, friends want to come over. So these guys here, they not only do they have a wicked day, I think we end up with seven or nine muskie in the boat. Uh, they got to go and watch what the tagging was all about, and they were excited to do that. And uh, so that, that was pretty darn cool that they got to partake uh, in the Thames River tagging. And it was awesome for me because the week before, I wasn't able to go out to Bell River. I was busy that day, and I was not able to uh, – I was not able to get out there and uh, help, and I was devastated, and they didn't get enough fish. They only had 14, I believe, that year, and they needed 20-something. So we got lucky in the next week. They were having to be in the Thames River just as I was coming through, so it worked out awesome to be able to help out a bit. Here's a picture of, from their boat. Um, on their boat, yeah, they uh, they collected them in the electro boat, and I think there was like seven muskie in there, and you could see the back of that one nice tiger. So yeah, that's a whole – a whole bunch of Thames River tagged muskie. Um, one of the important things about the tagging in the Thames River is they're trying to figure out um, where are these muskie going. And that's one of the parts of like where this study's going. Because right now there's nothing like up to the uh, just past Jeanette's Creek boat launch is basically the last transmitter or the last recorder that they have in the river. But they need to know how far up the river are they going. Um, I believe that some of these muskie go up in the creeks and spawn kind of like the pike do. Um, the pike, they come up our rivers and then they go off into the creeks off the Thames and off the off the Lake St. Clair and they go up the creeks and they spawn up the creeks. Well, I wouldn't doubt it. I've talked to some other local muskie guys and some say they believe they go up there too and others say they only spawn on the lake. Who knows? I definitely know they spawn on the lake in the shallows, but... Why couldn't they spawn in the uh, out in the Thames? And that's why the Thames is so um, important to this study. And uh, there's not many recorders up there, but this is where GLaDOS and the Lake St. Clair Musky Telemetry Study work good together because GLaDOS is, has big money because they have to. They're following like the walleye and like all the uh, commercial fisheries. Well. They're going to be putting a ton of recorders all the way up to Fanshawe Dam, I believe it is, in London. So we're going to benefit from that for our tagged fish. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll be able to see if those fish that we're tagging at the mouth of the Thames River are going all the way up to London. So that's pretty cool. So that's I wanted to show this fish that was angled and caught in uh, the Thames River. And uh, it's my wife and uh, our friend Dana Lucas. So you know what? That was a great day on the water. and. We're lucky to have a fishery like the Thames around here. Now, getting to that for the spawn, talking about the spawning grounds like muskie plus pike equals tigers. Oh my, that is freaking that gets me excited because tiger muskie are awesome. I love to catch them, they are so vicious. They actually hate you when you hook them up. I think, I think the reason they hate things so much is because they're not a pike and they're not a muskie. So I think when they go to go, it's kind of like Rudolph, they go to go play and they want to play with the muskie, they just laugh and like, nah, you're not a muskie, get out of here. They go to do it with the pike, they say the exact same thing. So I think that's why they fight so hard because even if you catch one like uh, Frank Thurston from Thirsty Lures here, even if you catch a monster like this one that Frank's holding, it's going to give you a battle. I, I don't even know what size that was. We never bothered to take a measurement, but that was his first ever tiger. But that's one of the key things about this telemetry study that's going to help the MNR out. So the reason I include a small picture like this, and it's in the Thames River again, are those muskie going and spawning? This goes back to what I was just saying. Are they going and spawning in the areas where um, the pike are spawning up the creeks? That could be because there's obviously a lot of crossbreeding because we've our tiger population has gone huge on Lake St. Clair. and. Uh, We've got a lot of them and we've got a lot of pike and we still got a ton of muskie, but what's going to happen down the road? Like if we have a crash, the telemetry study is going to give the data to the MNR for all these years so that they can go and take a look and say, Hey, where have these muskie been spawning over the years? So they know where to go look for them. If we have a big crash, like we did in 2006 with the VHS die off, then they have some data. Cause back then they had no data. They didn't know where just to go look. Then they can say, okay, we know that these muskies should be in this area. And they'll go in the spring and find the muskie. And if they're there, then they got to figure out 
is it did the pike rush them out like they did like up in the Kawartha Lakes? I know they have a lot of problems up in the Kawarthas. Is it like other bodies of water like that where the pike have taken over a area? So that's why a study like the telemetry study is so important. This picture here, I'm just about to wrap it up here, everybody. Uh, this picture here, when I see this, uh, it's my good friend Ryan Bonin and uh, his daughter Avery Rose. If you don't know who Avery is, uh, I've shared her stuff lots. I will continue to because she is the future of fishing. Not just future of muskie. She's the future of fishing. She's a young teenage girl who's got such a huge passion for fishing. So when I see this picture of a father daughter out there doing what they love it gives hope because just like us in our tagging study trying to learn what the future is for the musky you have to have people like avery and if you don't know who she is google avery rose check her out on instagram check her out on uh, facebook and uh youtube uh, she's doing so many things she's taking kids fishing and that's her line take a kid fishing that's why i put this picture here it's to remind you, hey, this whole study is about our future of the fishery, which is the same as if we don't get our kids out fishing and into the sport, who's going to follow in our footsteps to help out with projects like this? So I had to include a picture of a young person, and that is definitely who I had to pick for that because, uh, you know what, she's a pioneer for her young crew. This one here, uh, you know, we've all, we always try to stay humble here, and uh, you know what? we we do things and don't care to get kudos and don't ask for them we there's lots of things we do in the public and we get lots of kudos in that for it and uh you know what for this one here um this is jim harrod again and uh bruce bauer on the left in the white shirt and uh big jim mclaughlin he's hiding like even though he tried to hide he still couldn't hide behind uh jimmy but uh yeah, I was really blown away because uh, Jim gave us that uh, award for uh, the dedication we've had to helping out um, since 2005 when we joined uh, Muskie's Cannon, started helping out with things that we've done things with different studies. And Jim, the best part about him is he really, truly cared about everybody and he wanted to give us that. And uh, sometimes it's okay to say thank you. So we agreed with him that we would accept that award there. And the reason I put this picture here is because it's not about myself. It's not about my wife who's running the PowerPoint. And thank you for putting up with all my crap all the time. Because I always say yes. And then she figures it out. What I got to do. What I got us into. And it's not about any of that. This picture is for me says. If you. And I'm talking to you. Like every person who's watching this. And I appreciate everybody who stayed on and watched this. You can help. The fishing community. Do whatever it is that you can do. I've been blessed that uh, my business is growing and we are able to uh, do things through it. But if, you, if you're if you a tire shop, you know what? Do something for some winter tires or do something for alignment or oil change. Do whatever you can do in a fundraiser. And you, uh, you guys know how we do all our fundraisers. I don't want to say it and get everybody in trouble, but don't you figure out a way to do it. We've done it. We've done it through fishing derbies and we've done it through selling trips and donating all the money from my guided trips, selling bait packages, and donating hundred percent back um, to that. Do whatever you can do in your own personal business. If you have it or your life skill, you're a woodworker, build something and, and, and sell it and then donate the money. That's all. Donate your time is basically what I'm saying. So without all of us, um, these projects can't go on. So use whatever skill you have to uh, to uh, donate back. And uh, especially for things like this here, I think uh, the last slide, I think it is now. Especially for things like this here, like right now, everybody, all 400 and whatever it is of you guys or 500 of you guys who have been on this uh, Muskie Symposium, and I shouldn't say guys, guys and girls, um, Every one of you have helped out. There's been a ton of money raised through the symposium and the Odyssey uh, two weeks ago, like almost $50,000 raised there. That's insane. That's from all of you, all of you, every one of you, every one of you, every one of you. Yep. Turn around, look at yourself. Thank you all. Huge, huge thank you to Danny, <laughs> Danny's wife. I've never met you. I can only imagine what you've gone through because I put my wife through it for all these years. Huge thank you to you. 
I don't even know who's all helping Danny on doing this right now, but I know it's going to be insane for his uh, bait raffles. And it's I'm getting the one-minute signal, but I'm almost done. And uh, thank you all for helping him organize that because I know what it's like doing one raffle. Waffle. So um, thank you to Lisa and uh, to John from the Muskie Factory, for Lisa Goodyear for producing uh, all the seminars. That's been kick-ass. You've uh, you've done an amazing job on it. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. And thank you, John Anderson, for giving them the platform to do it. I know with your Monday Night Muskie Factory uh, um, shows, they've gone over wicked. So thank you all for that. Just everybody, please continue to support Muskie Research. It doesn't matter who it's through. Do what you can. You know what? Just go out and be a good musky nut. Take care, everybody. Cheers. Mike, great job. Um, uh, Mike had to step in kind of last minute there, and I guess I got to say a big thank you to Mike's wife because uh, the presentation had some great skill sets in it, and I'm sure it was uh, her doing as much as his. But the information was Mike's, and the time is Mike's, and uh, Handlebars and their entire family uh, are incredibly generous uh, at every corner, at every turn. You will find them uh, donating their time, donating their resources, uh, doing everything because they take pride in their community, um, taking kids fishing, um, having their mascot at different places, showing up at the shows, um, and donations of all kinds. Um, you know, Mike's a salt of the earth, awesome human being. And uh, definitely if you're going down to St. Clair for the first time and you're looking for a guide, uh, get in touch with Mike. And if, uh, if you're looking for um, something new, but still in that kind of spinner uh, bait world, uh, the High Roller was just released. I don't know when the next ones come out, but the first ones available are currently being uh, picked through over on the uh, bait picking side of the symposium. Um, I'm not going to talk too much more about that. Um, we're going to get into uh, a couple quick thank yous. Um, a brief discussion, and then I'm going to knock out the last draws. There's a bunch of them. Um, they take a little bit longer than we thought. Um, we raised $26,832.47. That's you guys. Um, that's what the symposium uh, bank accounts uh, are currently at. There's actually going to be a little bit more in there. Uh, Tony D'Souza from Riptides has uh, given us a substantially discounted set of uh, uh, Riptide rod holders and we're going to uh, do a, a waffle, so to speak, for them at their regular price, not an open-ended one. And then the difference between the discount and that will go right into the symposium. So thank you, Tony. And uh, that'll tack onto this a bit. There may be a couple other small things involved too that have come up during the course of the show. Um, but again, uh, Mike Parker, uh, Sean Landsman, uh, Dr. Cook, Jordana Bergman, um, Brent Bocek, Doug Wagner, and John Anderson, they all stepped up, and, uh, gave their time freely, um, lots of things went on in the background to make it happen. And uh, I got to thank all the presenters. Um, again, I think you helped me and helped us achieve the goal of uh, educating anglers, giving uh, a new edge and uh, helping us understand how that relationship between the researchers um, and the anglers and how they can collectively uh, benefit and work together. I think we saw that and we saw it um, uh, very, very well there. All of these presentations that you've seen, this is all recorded, all part of this awesome setup that the uh, Lisa Goodyear and uh, the Ottawa River Muskie Factory have been maintaining. You can go to their YouTube channel, um, uh, Ottawa River Muskie Factory, at least I showed it earlier. Um, or sorry, uh, yeah, Ottawa, there it is right there, Muskie Factory. If you go to the YouTube, check out Muskie Factory. Uh, all the seminars from that amazing, amazing uh, Monday Night Seminar series, uh, they're there, but also the seminars from today, that Doug Wagner one, um, uh, all the sites, it's all going to be there for you to go over again because you may not have got it all in the first time. So uh, give their uh, YouTube videos uh, a watch, like them, subscribe, helps promote them, and that's uh, the least we could do as a community. Um, I'm not going to go any further than that because there's still more draws to be done and we want to get this wrapped up sooner than later.